Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at our panel here on digital and privacy laws. I'm Eric Irvin. I'm a professor here at the law school uh, and also our associate dean for faculty research and programs. Um, what I'll do is I'll start off by briefly introducing each of our panelists, and then they're going to take uh, six minutes or so and talk about the research, and then we'll open it up for questions and some discussion. Um, so first is Justin Baxter. Um, this is not in any particular order, I guess alphabetic order for me, but not for them. So uh, Justin Baxter is an attorney at the firm of Baxter and Baxter LLP in Portland, Oregon. He earned his JD at the Northwestern School of Law at Lewis and Clark. His practice area focuses on consumer protection litigation with an emphasis on bringing fair credit reporting and unlawful debt collection cases in numerous jurisdictions across the country. Boyun Chang is a PhD candidate in economics at the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Oregon, and her research focuses on industrial organization, including competition, acquisitions, and the behavior of large corporations. Next, we have Alex Murray, who's an assistant professor of management at the University of Oregon's Lindquist College of Business. Alex earned his PhD in management and organization from the University of Washington and a master's in accounting from the University of Virginia. His research focuses on how entrepreneurs and others interact with distributed resources and decentralized organizations. And finally, Addison Sandoval is a joint JD MBA student at the University of Oregon. He holds a master's of fine arts in film and television production from the University of Southern California School of Cinematic Arts. And his research interests include identifying potential dangers consumers may encounter in digital markets and platforms and devising efficient strategies to reduce these risks. Um, so without any further ado, I'll hand it off to Justin to start off. Thank you. This may be a, perhaps an advisable tech check on the fly. I hope this works first time. Pretty awesome, huh? What? Awesome? No, I am. It's not awesome. We've been hacked. People's personal information, their, their credit cards, their, their passwords, they've all been compromised. Hey, nobody cares about that. It's not a big deal, guys. It is a massive deal. How do you not understand this? Hundreds of corporations have been hacked in the last few years and no one gave a shit. Name one. Equifax. <laughs> Name another. Target. Name another one. PlayStation. Name one more. Yahoo. Another. Marriott. Yes. One more. eBay, Uber, Anthem, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Home Depot, Facebook. God damn it. Fine. We UPS, get it. Chase Bank, Tumblr, LinkedIn, AOL. I am. People don't care about privacy. What they care about is a good story. <laughs> In September of 2017, Equifax announced that it, it experienced a massive data breach, which impacted the personal identifying information of approximately 147 million people. Um, Kelly Jones and I and our colleague Mike Fuller filed one of the first lawsuits in the country the next day uh, against Equifax alleging data breach. Um, that case was uh, shuttled uh, to an MDL in uh, Atlanta with uh, another thousand cases and it was transferred to, uh, it was assigned to a, a tall building law firm that had an eight figure line of credit and Kelly and I were told to sit in the corner and be quiet. Um, in about six to 18 months, everyone in this room will receive a settlement check for two nickels to rub together. You may also get a coupon or an email inviting you to sign up for free credit monitoring for a limited duration. And when the duration runs, you'll be invited again to subscribe for the paid credit monitoring for $14.99 a month. So let me say that again. Equifax's screwed up data privacy security systems caused data breach for, for 147 million Americans. And then the penalty was to get all of us to sign up for a paid subscription to their credit monitoring system. Okay, so I'm a credit reporting attorney. My lens, my rubric uh, of viewing data privacy is through the Fair Credit Reporting Act. I'll go back to the congressional findings of purpose uh, from 1976 in the act. Congress found, among other things, that an elaborate mechanism has been de developed for investigating and evaluating the credit worthiness, credit standing, credit capacity, character, and general reputation of consumers. And more importantly, there's a need to ensure that consumer reporting agencies exercise their grave responsibilities with fairness, 
impartiality, and a respect for the consumer's right to privacy. Now, the coin of the realm in the credit reporting world is PII, Personally Identifiable Information. Um, it's our names, our birthdays, our social security numbers, our addresses. Um, and Lord knows, between the Chinese government and the Russian mafia, it's all out there, everybody knows everything, and maybe there is no privacy. And yet, we grant these companies, these, these consumer reporting agencies, vast power over our information and our data. In trade, the Fair Credit Reporting Act provides that they can only sell consumer credit reports for certain permissible purposes. Normally this is credit applications initiated by the consumer, collection of debts, account review, promotional pre-approved credit offers. But once that data gets out into the wild, well, you know. Let me pivot away from the Fair Credit Reporting Act into data breach litigation. This is a sore spot and a weak spot in Oregon and across the country. Um, right now, Oregon data breach uh, legislation basically amounts to this. When a corporation discovers that it has uh, been breached and released personal, personally identifiable information into the wild, they have a duty to disclose it to the affected consumers. Um, and if there are more than 250 Oregon consumers affected, they have to report, they have to self-report to the Oregon Department of Justice. That's it. That's, that's the duty we impose upon corporations in Oregon. Years ago, one of the first uh, landmark lawsuits was filed after the Providence data breach. This case called Paul versus uh, Providence Health System. That court was that case was dismissed out of court, and the dismissal was affirmed on appeal by the Oregon Supreme Court. The basic crux of that ruling was that there was no causal nexus. There was um, the plaintiff's allegation of injury was insufficient to state a claim for emotional distress because the plaintiff's alleged emotional distress was premised entirely on the risk of future identity theft, not on any actual identity theft or present financial harm. It was hard, if not impossible, for those consumers who knew that they were subject to the data breach to show that they were actually harmed in real time by the breach. Um, that is a, an Oregon case, but the basic holding is proliferating and has proliferated across the country, and it represents uh, a failing um, of this area of the law for the exact reason of the video that I started with, which is everybody's data is everywhere and accessible by everyone. So I'm here to propose a legislative fix in addition to uh, 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 safeguards and, and duties of maintaining and securing consumers' data. We need a private cause of action so that consumers can act uh, as both the, the, the statute can act as both a remedy and a regulatory device. Um, what I'm proposing are statutory damages, don't require the consumers to prove an actual out-of-pocket dollar loss, but rather every time a consumer uh, is part of a data breach, they can uh, bring a case in court by dint of having been uh, the victim of, of the uh, of the breach, and the, the last piece of the puzzle is I would propose that we graft a causation uh, standard from the Fair Credit Reporting Act onto this data breach statute, this data breach cause of action, rather than the old common law uh, premise of proving but for causation, uh, the courts have applied the Fair Credit Reporting Act, have interpreted the, the, the FCRA to apply a substantial factor test. So if a consumer can show that, uh, that the data breach was a substantial factor in causing their harm, including the anxiety caused by getting that notice in the mail that you've been subject to a data breach, that should be enough to get us across the finish line and, uh, and uh, recover uh, statutory damages. Thank you.
can um, sit there or pull yeah. up the Yeah, I'll, I'll just sit here in this one, right? Oh, am okay. I? Okay. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, so my name is Po Yun, and I'm a PhD candidate in economics at the University of Oregon. Uh, so I just want to briefly uh, go through what my co-author and I are doing the research with the grant supported by consumer protection um, grants. So is this okay? Okay, cool. So uh, we are looking at um, basically the. So the keywords of our research involves commission rate, and then app distribution channels, and then the new le new legislation that's been enacted in South Korea. Now, uh, traditionally, what was happening in this realm is that uh, this Google Play or Apple App Store that has this dominant uh, user base uh, charges thirty percent of commission rate for the developers uh, who are interested in distributing their apps through using these two platforms. Now, why is that the problem? Because first, the 30% commission rate can be deemed arbitrary for some people because it's not a competitive price per se. Um, it's just, uh, it can be considered a dictated uh, commission rate that's imposed uh, uh, by the app distribution channels. Now, um, secondly, the, uh, the problem comes from uh, time or bundling these in-app transactions or monitor uh, 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 billing system uh, with the app distribution channel. So what they're basically doing is that, um, you know, for example, Google Play, uh, they're enforcing or requiring these app developers to only use the, the platform's billing system in order to process the in-app transactions. So for example, let me give a, a concise uh, example of this. So let's say that I'm a developer and I want, I came up with this very uh, innovative game applications, hopefully, and I want to distribute this app through Google Play. Now, for every $100 revenue generated from the applications, $30 are going to the Google Play, while $70 are going into my pocket. Now, how they do this is they're uh, bundling the in-app or uh, billing system together with uh, the in-app transaction that occur inside of an app, so that basically every time $100 is charged or is uh, generated by the revenue for, for the specific app, you know, Google Play can automatically take 30% cut of this revenue, right? So um, what the South Korea legislation, so I think it's a, a great time to discuss about what this uh, new legislation that has been enacted in 2021 September in South Korea. Now what this legislation does is, is uh, it's effectively making the developers to choose alternative billing system. So basically, you know, one way to go around the 30% commission rate is to, uh, you know, direct these users to use alternative billing systems that are outside of this um, platform's billing system. So um, my, my co-author and I um, are trying to uh, estimate the effect of this legislation um, and see how that's going to impact the developers as well as consumers by uh, looking at the app performance. Um, so we try, we, uh, as a preliminary result or a preliminary analysis, uh, we uh, select uh, 13 applications, mobile applications, um, or that, that fall into a game category that we think are producing a large volume of you know, transactions that are likely to be uh, affected the most. Um, and uh, using uh, three sources of variation. So we are looking at um, the applications in the South Korea that are affected by this legislation versus the apps um, that are operating elsewhere, like other countries that doesn't actually have such reg regulations and see how the changes, uh, how there's any significant changes as in terms of app performance. Like, are they increasing app installs or are they increasing app revenue? Um, and our preliminary analysis uh, suggests that uh, there's a tendency of increasing app revenue as in, uh, uh, in response to the legislation, although uh, our estimates suggest a noisy estimate. Now, what that implies is that maybe that's, that's partly due to the fact that what we are looking at are just 13 applications, and so that's not enough data points. Now, so for our su uh, subsequent um, analysis, we try to expand the number of applications that we're looking at, but at the same time, 
uh, we're trying to extend the period that we're looking at because uh, preliminary analysis, we only looked at like several, uh, several months after the enactment of the legislation. And so now we have uh, several more months or, or hopefully a year after uh, the regulation has been initiated. And so hopefully with that, um, with that extended period of time, but at the same time, the increased number of applications that we're looking at, maybe uh, we're, uh, we're, we can hopefully capture some of the, some of the uh, statistically significant um, effect of this uh, regulation. Now, um, I want to uh, finish my uh, presentation by, um, by mentioning one last thing, which is how is it relevant to consumers, right? So um, now this you know, decoupling, of, you know, uh, decoupling of the mobile payment system um, can actually uh, invoke the competition in the in-app billing system market. Uh, which hopefully can uh, bring down this 30% commission rate that are charged by the developers, and hopefully that could pass down onto the consumers, which can uh, also uh, imply a positive implication for the consumers because now they can uh, purchase the same item with a lower price. Um, so basically, you know, the reduction in the cost saving uh, from the regulations that are imposed to the developers can potentially uh, pass down to consumers, uh, effectively uh, uh, potentially bringing a uh, positive implications uh, for the consumers. So uh, that's about our, what my research or our research is about. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I was walking over from the Monk Scholars business where I'm on Dadley, and um, I was thinking, which project do I want to talk about? So clearly I was prepared. And um, I decided I want to talk about a new data collection effort. So this is something going on in the experimental synth music scene in New York City. Um, we're collecting data there now. And I actually want to open with an activity. Um, so let me just ask a question. Um, if you could have a single release by any artist alive or dead tomorrow, who would it be? So, yeah. Prince. Prince. Okay, so Prince is releasing a new single tomorrow. If you could have any lyricist write a song, who would it be? So Prince is singing it, Prince is on stage. Who's singing it? Or sorry, who's writing the song? Excuse me. DJ Khaled. <laughs> All right, DJ Kelly is writing the track. Prince is performing it, styling of Prince. Let's throw something out there, even though Prince is a phenomenal guitarist. Who's playing guitar? Slash. Slash, okay. Slash is playing the guitar. DJ Kelly's writing the song. Prince is performing it. That is increasingly possible in the New York synth scene, right? Because we have generative AI at the backstop of the, of the synthesizer, of the accompanying musicians, of the accompanying lyricists, right? So you can increasingly write such a prompt and have that on stage with you. Now, what does that have to do with consumer protection? Absolutely nothing. But it does if you generalize for a second. So let's talk about what you and I produce every single day that's owned by a large corporation, right? It's our dad, right? So say I'm a social media influencer. I'm not. But let's just say I have 10,000, 100,000 tweets. That can be mine, right? Tomorrow, someone could write, draft a tweet, or prompt, I should say, draft a tweet in the styling of Alex Murray on the conflict in Israel. And they could mine all my data and say, here is the tweet that comes out tomorrow, right? And I have no say over that. It sounds like my voice. It could look like my voice. That misinformation is increasingly proliferating across a number of platforms. Why? Because the consumers do not own that data. So how do you decentralize those platforms, right? How do you reconstruct this system where you have large hierarchical organizations that own our data that we've produced and given to them really for the past 15 years, but truly in the last decade? And that's where some of the work my PhD students and I are doing on the role of NFTs. So actually looking at how do you tokenize information, how do you tokenize each piece of information at the individual level so it shows ownership and it is valid in the eyes, ideally, of the court of law. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm going to turn you all on that. But it is validated, it is immutable, it is traceable, it is transparent and allocated to that individual person in an online realm. We happen to be doing work on the metaverse, so working with a number of firms up in Seattle looking at that, right? But how do you trace that to the individual? But if you take a step further, 
if you actually then have an AI agent that you're interacting with online that's aggregating data, how do you know that that's a valid agent? Right? So you can also then tokenize those actors that you're interacting with online in such a way that, oh, this is a valid actor. Right? So I'm just throwing these ideas out there right now, building on what's happening in the music scene, because there's a lot around there in intellectual property, right? We have a hologram with Tina Turner on stage, who owns that? Um, questions there. But if you take that over then to the ownership of data that you and I create as consumers and users of these platforms, what does that mean going forward, particularly as misinformation can increasingly and accurately be drawn on it and proliferated on the internet? Um, how do we trace that? How do we have trackable, traceable goods? And that's what we're looking at, both coding them, and then also how do we recognize them and develop a larger system? So just throwing ideas out there today, um, but that's some of the stuff we're working on. Happy to talk about it more in the Q&A, but I want to move to the Q&A. This thing off the uh, First of all, I want to thank uh, Professor Gerben for the introduction, and uh, Professor Tippett and Melissa Panther for organizing this event. Um, my research focuses on consumer contracts in the digital economy. Specifically, I delve into the interplay between forum selection clauses and consumer protection laws. The forum selection clause mandates where a plaintiff can have their case heard. Generally, the plaintiff can choose this location. However, when a form selection clause is present, it effectively removes the plaintiff's venue privilege. Courts in Oregon have chosen the, to follow the federal standard of putting the right to contract over the consumer by overwhelmingly enforcing form selection clauses. Now, this is troubling because according to a recent survey by Oregon Consumer Justice, uh, Two-thirds of Oregon uh, residents who participated in the survey admitted to only sometimes or never reading and fully understanding the terms and conditions of the contracts they agreed to online. Thus, when form selection clauses are inserted into contracts, especially digital contracts, they can lead to out adverse outcomes for Oregon consumers. Uh, in my research, I highlight three examples where this was especially problematic in the first case, Beard versus PayPal, uh, the plaintiff alleged $300,000 in damages, and uh, the contract stipulated that the Oregon consumer could only bring the case to court in California or Nebraska, whereas PayPal was allowed to sue uh, the plaintiff anywhere it wanted. Uh, that case ended up being ousted to California. In another case, Schuldner versus TransUnion, uh, the consumer alleged breach of contract and unjust enrichment. That case was ousted to Delaware. Finally, in Wolf versus RV factory, that consumer alleged that he was induced to buy an RV through false and misleading representations, and that case was ousted to Indiana. Now, uh, I argue that the Oregon legislature, through the Oregon Unlawful Trade Practices Act, intended for citizens to act as private attorneys general when the apparatus of the state is either too busy or for some other reason can't take the case. Acting in that capacity, ordinary citizens should be able to vindicate their rights in Oregon courts without being limited by forum selection clauses. In the research, I also offer recommendations for how to improve digital contracts. Uh, firstly, I propose limiting the length of digital contracts, uh, depending on the size and resolution of the screen. Uh, going back to the PayPal case, uh, PayPal's user agreement is nearly 100 pages long, uh, and that makes it very difficult if you're using a mobile device to read it. Uh, secondly, I propose mandating uh, translations for digital contracts. Uh, just as uh, voting materials are made available in different languages to support a fair and a democratic online a democratic system, online contracts should also offer explanations written in plain language so that everybody can understand them. Uh, as everyone in this room knows, the language of the law can be highly specialized and recondite, uh, so this will be very helpful to consumers. Uh, finally, I propose ending the use of boilerplate language. This is language that purports to waive consumers' rights 
in a wholesale manner. Now, I believe that by adopting these recommendations, Oregon will stay up to date with the constantly evolving digital landscape. Uh, furthermore, I believe these changes will be, uh, they'll act as a disincentive uh, for those seeking to take advantage of Oregon consumers. Uh, and I just want to say thank you to everyone uh, in attendance. Thank you to all of our panelists um, for setting the stage here. We now have um, our next segment here. I'd like to take questions from the audience um, for the panel, either individuals or for all of them. And um, because we're recording, I'll walk this mic around to anyone who has a question. So. Professor Irwin? Yes. Well, uh, you can I also, can yes, sure, go ahead. <laughs> Jazz, fantastic research. Thank you for presenting that. The question I have is, um, do you draw a distinction between uh, forum selection clauses and uh, forced arbitration clauses? Uh, well, there is a distinction, um, but my uh, focus in this project was just on forum selection clauses because they uh, forced someone to, they forced the case out of Oregon, and this project was focused on Oregon consumers, and uh, there's a clause in the Oregon Constitution that says uh, the Oregon courts should be open uh, to all without fear or favor. So I believe that that should apply with forum selection clauses. Thank you. I'll start over here just from ease and I'll over here. I have a question for you, uh, Mr. Baxter. Um, I guess my question is what, you know, with the legislative fix that you proposed, um, like there's a, a very clear and important benefit for consumers, right? That consumers have some avenue for vindication and um, some way to be made whole, you know, partially whole. Um, my question is then on sort of dissuading or the sort of preventative aspect of that. Is there a sense that enacting sort of uh, statutory damages and basically making it, you know, more significant impact, uh, consequences for companies that end up breached, will that, do you think that that will, re I guess, result in better practices by these corporations? Or is it a sense that like these corporations are really never gonna be ahead of the bad actors um, and that these are just gonna be, these breaches are gonna be, continue to happen because bad actors are more advanced on technology and always gonna be able to exploit something um, and prevention is sort of secondary to the ability to, to you know, make consumers somewhat um, compensated for the harm that they, they'll face. Yeah, thanks for that question, Leland Baxter Neal, Oregon Consumer Justice, my long lost cousin. Um, consumers need both a sword and a shield. You know, the long arc of consumer protection laws started with disclosures and information, but also then affirmative defenses and protections. But what we know now is, is consumers need a right, they need a remedy to enforce their right. And so those statutory damages allow individual consumers access to the courts to bring cases as private attorneys general. So yes, we need uh, an affirmative action, an, an affirmative right of action, not just disclosures, not just uh, affirmative defenses. First of all, thank you all for talking. We're really, we've been really interested. Um, one question that I had, which is going to sound kind of plain, I think, to you guys, um, but as somebody who doesn't do a lot of research on business, I'm curious. So there's been like a lot of talk of in the media and things about what companies can do with this data sharing and with these breaches. But what, as a consumer, like what specifically would that impact look like to me, or what could should I be fearful of when I'm blindly signing these contracts. I guess kind of like, a, yeah, it's pretty plain, but what would you guys say to that, I guess? Just, you have to experience this. <laughs> <laughs> so one idea I have sort of percolating in my head is right now the zeitgeist, the cultural zeitgeist, is talking about Facebook and these online companies that aggregate data and then turn around and try to monetize them, create profiles that they can turn around and sell for 
ads or marketing or, or AI. Um, but what is astonishing to me is the, the amount of data that we provide voluntarily every moment of every day. You know, Equifax says that they process a billion pieces of, of personal identifying information every day. Um, and we give that up willingly for free. The, the benefit ostensibly to consumers is maybe you get your 10% instant discount with uh, signing up for a charge card at the department store. But, but other than that, we're just giving this up for free. And that's the same with online information and, and data and your uh, internet usage. I think that the tide has turned. The, um, Addison is proposing, you know, more um, uh, rights and protections for consumers. When you click that, I agree to the terms and conditions button, there has to be something more akin to actual meaningful consent and you know, a willful, willing and knowing waiver of rights before we just sign away our, our rights. I have a question for um, Professor Murray. Yes. Um, so this is, about a month ago I read an article in the Washington Post about um, some college students that are working on, I think they call it Design It For Us, but it's a digital privacy um, sort of bill of rights. For, and it, it's primarily designed as a focus toward kids and teens, um, but they have an AI bill of rights. And I was curious if you had a chance to review that or if you've thought about that at all and, um, and where you think that could go. Yeah, so I haven't read that specifically. Um, but do you want to shed more light on what the contents were real quick? No, because I, I, I can I, talk. I mean, I can. Why don't you just, I'll, I'll, just I'll share it with you after. OK, okay. we'll talk okay. offline and I'll read okay. for a second. Um, just for a second. Um, so, but I actually want to go back to the prior question as long as I think it relates. Um, because I think a lot of solutions being proposed are regulatory, right? And I think there are also technological solutions. Um, and I think that is where a lot of the design is coming from in new organizational design and the new interaction between humans and AI and humans um, and what platform that exists on. And I was recently in DC speaking on a platform with regulators, but then it was followed by a platform, or sorry, a panel of regulators, and then it was followed by a panel of venture capitalists. And they said they're not going to invest in another AI startup if there's not a decentralized ledger back end. And why is that? Because that records each piece of data and provides a safeguard against you know, kind of AI people going rogue, having hallucinations, and being able to track you know, misinformation and proliferation. Um, and it's this idea that you then have this validation of who you're interacting with in an online environment. Um, I think another benign example here that I just want to throw out there, because I think it's just an illustration of where we're going, um, as I was speaking on a panel in Boston on Web3 recently, and um, prior to like, hey, do you care if we use this pro um, promotional material? And I was like, well, what is it? It's in a video. And it was the six panelists um, interacting with one another. So it was an avatar of myself, lifelike. And they used generative AI to mine each of our research streams and have a conversation with one another. And it was just a video. So then I just kind of shot back and like, sure, go ahead. But why the hell am I even showing up? Um, because that's what's possible, right? So I. <laughs> It's a long-winded answer, and I want to talk to you more about it, um, just because there's a lot that's happening that's happening really fast, and I don't know if regulation is keeping up with it. So how do we design a technological backend to safeguard it, have a backstop and safeguard against what's coming? Um, that's, I'm just going to throw that out there. Hello. Thank you all so much for your research. I found it extremely interesting. Uh, a lot of what was discussed today was about like a statutory intervention into for the call uh, to protect consumers in a digital age. And I was just wondering, based on your research, and this is open for the panel, uh, does the growing need for consumer digital protection, you know, always kind of call for a statutory intervention, or what are some other ways that the law can like adapt to? protect consumers that don't necessarily involve like a statutory requirement? I have thoughts, <laughs> of course, <laughs> nobody's surprised. So um, the common law can be a tool. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, we have the common law uh, idea of invasion of privacy, intrusion upon seclusion, disclosure of public disclosure of private facts. Those are all common law causes of action. But the common law time and again fails us. That's why we have consumer protection statutes. Fraud, common law fraud, the, 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 you know, they teach us in, in first year torts the eight elements of common law fraud that we have to establish by clear and convincing evidence. 
that never worked. So there, that's why we have the FTC, the Fair, Tra the Fair Trade Commission Act in the 60s, which uh, in turn begat the state-by-state -state unlawful uh, or uniform deceptive acts and practices statutes in the 70s. That's what we need. We need legislators to get to work and do their work in Salem and pass laws that will protect us as consumers. Um, so I have a question then. Oh, yeah. I want to echo everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm wondering, and maybe this will go to you, Justin, too, or all of you, um, how do you respond to the idea that a private right of action is just a way to uh, promote the legal field, like attorneys looking for any statutory um, opening to take more cases as a lawyer? Um, because I, I hear a lot of that talk here, but um, I'm not sure how to battle that pushback if, if that comes up. 100%. I appreciate you asking the question. As a member of the private plaintiff's bar, I bring these cases. This is how I put food on my table for my kids. But the example I just gave is exactly why we need a private cause of action. Because um, the initial round of legislation created the, fair, the Federal Fair Trade Commission. But they only have so many lawyers. They only have so much uh, enforcement uh, uh, authority. And then the next round, state by state, UDAP statutes. Again, empowered attorneys general state by state to bring cases. But it was when we added the private cause of action that allowed individual aggrieved consumers to bring a case to, vind to vindicate their own rights we have this principle in Oregon that statutes, consumer protection statutes, are both remedial, they provide a remedy, but also regulatory. They cause uh, businesses to conform to the law. And these laws are not just good for consumers, they're good for the other businesses that choose to comport with the law. It levels the playing field and takes away the competitive advantages to the companies that, that want to cheat. I guess to that question, like what in your view, Justin, what do you think is could or should be done to increase the size of the, of the consumer law bar here in Oregon? Is it about the remedies? Is it about like interest in law students? Is it about damages? Is it about something else? Like interesting your thoughts on that. Yeah, I want to talk about Oregon Consumer Justice, a new nonprofit uh, in Oregon that uh, was formed out of a Cypre award from a class action against BP Northwest. Um, David Sugarman brought a case, David Sugarman and his team brought a case for, for uh, misrepresenting failure to disclose charge card fees uh, at the gas station at the pump. And they won an amazing award and part of the, the jury verdict was uh, to create uh, Oregon Consumer Justice and uh, create a pipeline for education, advocacy, and litigation. And what we want to see is this virtual, virtuous cycle that brings up uh, young law students into the private bar, moves private uh, litigants, uh, private attorneys onto the bench, into the legislature, um, and, and into academia, and creates a new cultural zeitgeist. You know, I, I remember seeing um, that moment, the Occupy Wall Street uh, movement that came about from the mortgage meltdown in the early aughts. And we thought for a moment that we had, had seized that, that uh, just that movement and that what was gonna spring from that would, would be uh, a new age of consumer protection laws and enforcement has not happened yet. And it is a time uh, for uh, the private bar to come together again with government uh, agencies and with academia and uh, uh, legislation to um, protect consumers and hold corporations to account. So I'll ask one follow-up question. I think it's in the, in the same vein, just thinking about the different, the projects that you have. Um, in a way, Alex's your work is, uh, if, we did, if we get this right, we might mitigate harm. 
we can actually authenticate people so so or transactions, which means identity theft goes away. Um, and um, so we have these kind of technology solutions, but they're industry-wide technology solutions, not something one company can do. Um, is there a way, just for anyone out here to think about, is there a way to incentivize the entire industry to do these things um, and get behind them? And uh, kind of related to that last question, in the interim, would it be a better idea to the extent that no company can keep up with identity theft, um, to have more of a compensatory regime, like insurance uh, effectively regime instead of, um, well, anyway, I'll just leave it at that. And thoughts people have on, on, on that kind of juxtaposition, if it is truly an industry, like a global industry-wide problem where the technology that causes the harm, uh, our ability to stop it hasn't kept up. That's a great question. Um, so, I mean, if you look at just, I think, the evolution of what 1.0, right, where it was individuals creating, drafting content, um, but it was, the user interface was very complex. So you get to Web 2.0, and now you have corporations getting involved that create user interfaces that allow individuals to create more data, to interact, to exchange, to whether it's producing content on X now or Instagram, or it's exchanging with um, Amazon. Um, it made those transactions easier and allowed to happen. But to your point, they collected and harvested the data. Um, so now Web 3.0, if you get to where we're at now and what's emergent, you know, if you look at a technological S curve, it's not quite there yet. Um, and all I mean by that is like, you know, the technology, the capabilities aren't quite at a Web 2.0 level with our current you know, systems online, but that's drastically changing. And as new entrants come into the fold and are you know, based on the concept or principles of decentralization and individual ownership of data, um, I think my hope would be individuals start gravitating and seeing the efficiencies there, seeing the security, seeing the privacy, and then it'll be a superior product say 10 years from now. So I think we're in an era, era of vast disruption. Um, and I curious to see what happens. I'm speculating a bit here as to how established players will transition because I do think there will be a lot of emergent players. I mean, if, even if you just look at unicorn firms today, so billion dollar valuation companies, almost 90% of them didn't exist 10 years ago. So I think you're going to see a lot more emerging in this space that is going to disrupt your Microsoft, your Amazon, your Equifax, all these firms that have established you know, business models, huh? I think that's going to transition drastically. So to your question, I don't know if it's the industry-wide change. I think you're going to see industry-wide disruption. All right. Well, thank you. We're at time here. I want to thank again all the panelists for your insights and also your work. Thank you.